again here at South Suburban Christian Church. I'm really uh, grateful that you have taken the time uh, to be with us uh, uh, today as we continue in our series, The Gospel. Um, we're in the um, uh, book of Ephesians. This is our third message. We're going to be looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And I would encourage you to, uh, uh, if you could find your Bible or your tablet or your phone or however you read God's Word, that you would turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, I'm not going to be looking at the whole chapter today. I do certainly, what pastor wouldn't, encourage you to read all of chapter 3. Uh, but I'm going to be picking up at verse 14 and uh, reading through verse 19. So just a few verses today as we focus on this. And then I want to... Uh, uh, um, just for a few moments, reflect back to where we've been and then look forward to where we're going. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Um, the Holy Spirit has con been convicting me, and, uh, and I'm grateful for um, this uh, opportunity to study God's Word together with you. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you be filled with all the fullness of God. It rends the reading of God's holy and perfect word. May he add his blessing and understanding to it. Thus far in our series in the gospel, our study through Ephesians, we have defined the gospel. That was our first week. The gospel is Christ, about what he has done and how his merits uh, can become our own through faith and faith alone. Um, we talked a little bit about that uh, God was, quote, uniting all things in Him, and, and how that word uniting uh, really carries the idea of a household, that God is bringing us into His household. That's, where, that's how we're being united, by coming into the household of God. Um, that week after I did that message, I uh, received a, an email, um, and I want to read that email to you today. I've gotten permission um, uh, from the Jascots to read this email to you. Just wanted to share an experience Brian and I had at breakfast today with the sermon fresh on our minds. We went to our favorite breakfast place. Normally a pleasant place. Today's experience was not. We waited for at least 35 minutes to be seated, although there were many empty tables and many people still waiting behind us. While taking our order, the waitress snapped at Brian when he asked for a straw. And then his order arrived and it wasn't correct. Rather than complain, he just ate his eggs the way he didn't want them. And then I began to look around wondering, what on earth is going on? You could cut the tension in the air with a knife. The customers were fussing at the staff, the staff were biting back at the customers, and the manager was grumping at everybody. When our waitress came back to the table, pushing a plate at Brian with the correct eggs and muttering, here, it was my fault, I gently placed my hand on her arm and I said, sweet girl, you are having a hard day, and I am so sorry. In an instant, her mood softened, and her story came bubbling out. She told us not only her, but all the staff were under pressure. One cook had quit, leaving only one cook to handle uh, all the rest. A busboy had been pressed into the position of a cook, and the folks that they had repeatedly hired were not responsible and sometimes didn't even show up. They just were having a terrible time finding reliable help. On top of it all, she had just found out she was nine weeks pregnant, and she was exhausted. We continued to listen and let her know we appreciated her and that the job she was doing was a hard one. We told her she and the staff would be in our prayers. Her face softened, and there was finally a smile. And she said, thank you. And she got a good tip. <laughs> the email goes on. I'm not sharing this because Brian and I are such great people, because we serve, but because we serve a great God. And the change in her attitude was noticeable. I hope we shared God's love today in our household in a meaningful way, which was the answers to questions 3A and B on the study guide, of course. 
We will continue to go there, even though the wait is long. And I plan to keep an eye on this young waitress. I feel God has placed her in our hearts. That was week one. Week two, we looked at Ephesians chapter two, and we looked at the consequences of our salvation. That is, is that we are God's workmanship, and that we have been created to be those through which God is doing His work that He prepared beforehand. Well, I got several emails this past week, too, and phone calls, and I have permission to share another one with you from Jay Richard. He writes, I had an aha moment in your sermon. So you know how, like most people, with any amount of kindness in them have helped strangers? For me, most of the time, it may be because I took pity on them, or I felt I could just help, or I had been in their shoes, or because of that small, quiet voice, right? Sometimes they say something like, you're an answer to prayer, or similar. I don't know how to feel about that. I'm just someone trying to help, and saying I'm an answer to prayer can be a burden or a weight, maybe. If I'm honest, maybe it is sometimes out of a sense of obligation for being Christian. Or maybe I do want some adoration or confirmation that I'm not just taking up air in this place. But then it hit me. I might just be an answer to prayer, but it has nothing to do with me. I'm not the source or the prayer. I'm a channel or a conduit. It is an answer to prayer, all right, but not to me or because of me. It's because of Christ. Christ using a wretched, undeserving, sinful creature, me, to answer the prayers of others. Today, we are in our third week and almost ready to break loose as Paul is continuing in his revelation of what it means to be a gospel people, a gospel church. But before he starts laying, laying down um, a life for us in the next chapter, in chapter 4, what a gospel life looks like in all of its facets, he is preparing us for that journey in chapter 3, which I have um, chosen to call a gospel posture. A gospel posture. Point one. Paul's gospel posture for us. In verse 14 of the text, the very first few words that I read to you, for this reason, I bow my knees. You know, posture when praying was really important to the Jewish people. And depending on what you were praying for would govern your posture for prayer. If you look through the entirety of the Bible, you'll find five basic postures for prayer. The first posture for prayer is standing. Eyes open, looking up to heaven, hands uplifted, and palms facing up. In Luke chapter 9, 28 through 32, and in John chapter 17, verse 1, we have two examples of Jesus praying while standing. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul tells his young student that he desires for the church to all pray with their hands lifted in prayer, alluding to that standing position. Uh, the second uh, uh, posture for prayer is, is also standing, but this time the one praying is looking down, or their eyes are closed and their hands are clasped down to their, by their waist. This is a traditional posture for a shackled prisoner. When a prisoner had been captured in war and was brought before the conquering king, that's how the prisoner would present himself. The hands are clasped at the waist as if they were shackled by chains. The eyes are averted away from the king. For an ancient time, looking at one's captor was considered insolent and was a good way to get, your, get yourself killed. The posture is for submissive petitions or intercessory or penitential prayer, as we see in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 13. You remember the story where Jesus is describing the difference between how a Pharisee prays and how a tax collector prays. The third is prostrate. This is pretty intense, where the one praying lies on their stomach with their eyes looking down, their hands extended down. This is a traditional pet posture for begging favors for a king. 
when the favors especially are favors that are either significant or great or that the uh, petitioner is desperate and has no standing before the king, even in a literal sense. It became the uh, traditional posture for a desperate prayer, and even today is the predominant posture when Christians pray that are a part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church or the Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt. We see this posture used in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 38 through 39, where Jesus himself, the night before he's arrested and ultimately crucified, prays in this prostrate posture. The fourth posture is the least found in the Bible, and ironically, it's probably the most practiced today. And it's the one where you are sitting. Now, generally, the one praying sits with head bowed, hands folded. And I'm pretty sure, I, I, I did as exhaustive of a search as I could, that this posture is only found in the Bible one time. You might be able to find more, and you can send me an email. But in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18, David sits as he prays after God has promised him that the Messiah would come from his lineage. The fifth, and the one that is described probably most frequently in the Bible, is the posture known as kneeling. Now, like the prostrate posture, this is uh, a significant posture as we think about what it means about where our hearts and our minds are when we come to the one true God of the universe, when we, we, when we make our request known to the King. It conveys submission. It conveys humility. It conveys surrender. Now, to kneel for someone else though, well, that is even more significant. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 54, Solomon prayed on his knees. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 5, the prophet Ezra prays on his knees. The psalmist calls all of us to kneel. In Psalm 95, 6, Daniel prays on his knees. In Daniel 6, verse 10, people come to Jesus and they kneel. Matthew 17, 14. Matthew 20, 20, Mark 1, 40, and many, many more. Stephen prayed on his knees in Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Peter prayed on his knees in Acts chapter 9, verse 40. Paul prayed on his knees in Acts chapter 20, verse 36. And other early Christians prayed on their knees, the Bible tells us, in Acts chapter 21, verse 5. And most importantly, Jesus prayed on his knees. Luke twenty two forty one. 41. Now, now, the Bible has enough prayer not on the knees to show us that praying on your knees isn't necessarily required. But it is also enough mentions in the Bible to show us that sometimes praying on our knees, if at all possible, is a good thing. Here, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul kneels. This Pharisee, this apostle, this mountain of a man in the faith, humbles himself before God to pray for the Ephesians, to pray for the whole church, to pray for you and me. You are reading a prayer that the apostle Paul was on his knees praying for you and for me. My second point is the gospel posture reminds us that we are God's temple. You remember last week when we finished chapter 2 and we were reminded that God is building himself, quote, a dwelling place by God, by, for God, by the Spirit. You might not have heard the name Adam Clark, but he was one of the world's most preeminent preachers in the early 19th century. And as a matter of fact, in the early 1800s, he would have been uh, Europe's version of Billy Graham. His greatest contribution, how he's most known, is uh, his, his insights that helped scholars and archaeologists decipher the Rosetta Stone. 
I won't go into all of that, but it's an artifact that was found that ultimately allowed us to be able to translate Egypt, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. But what most folks don't know about, at least in the church world that he's most known for, is that he has written an entire commentary of the Bible. It took him 40 years to write the commentary. And in this commentary, as he quotes and as he writes about Ephesians chapter 4, he is convinced, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3, he is convinced that this prayer in Ephesians 3 is intentionally connected to another incident in Scripture in style and in details that it can't be just a coincidence. And that those who are reading this would have known. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 53. The incident is also found in 2 Chronicles 6, 12 to 42. And it is the text where we read about how the temple in Jerusalem was completed and King Solomon prays for the temple. In this prayer, part of it, he is standing. But for the last part of the prayer, he is kneeling. And in that prayer for the temple, he lists ten things that he prays that this temple will give to the world. Now, in our study guides or on our Version Bible app, you can read those. I've listed those ten requests that Solomon includes in that prayer, and they're pretty powerful. So if good old Pastor Adam Clark is right, just as Solomon knelt to pray for the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem, well, so now does Paul kneel to pray for the temple that's not made with human hands, the temple that God himself is building which is the church, which you and I are the building materials for that. The third and final point I want to share with you is that the gospel posture begs for strength, knowledge, and love. Look at verse 16. I'm going to be jumping from 16 to 18 to 19 that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit, verse 18, that you may have strength to comprehend, and 19, and to know the love of Christ, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So as Solomon prayed for ten things, Paul prays for three things. They're important numbers. Paul prays for power. He prays for comprehension or, or knowledge. And he prays for love so that the fullness of God will fill you. Now, remember, this is a prayer not for us as individuals, but for the church, for you all, for all of us. Every single one of those words in this prayer are the second person plural. This is going to be important as we go into next week's message, and particularly as we look at the first 16 verses of Ephesians 4, where Paul talks about the marks of the gospel church. But here is what is exciting in this prayer. These things for which Paul prays are all going toward something. You can see it clearly in the English, and you can really see it clearly in the original language. The power that Paul is praying for, the comprehension that Paul is praying for, the knowledge that Paul is praying for is all going toward that final petition, the petition for love. Paul is asking God for the power for the church to love. Paul is asking for the comprehension and the knowledge of the height and the depth and the breadth so that the church can love. But that begs the question, doesn't it? What does it mean to love? Remember when Jesus is teaching about the law and Moses, uh, the law of Moses in Matthew chapter 22? He's just been asked by a religious leader, a lawyer, what is the greatest commandment? There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And in true human fashion, we human beings want all of that boiled down to the lowest common denominator. I mean, ask how you'd feel if your spouse came to you and said, Honey, what is the least that I can do so that you won't leave me. Well, in Matthew 22, verse 35, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang, depend, all the law and prophets. If we go back to Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings that I was talking to you about a little bit ago, we see things like <clears throat> Solomon is praying that the temple will be a house of prayer, a, a place of justice, a, a place of redemption, a place to find mercy, a place to welcome the stranger, and, and five more other petitions. And every single one of those, if you boiled those petitions down, they would be the natural uh, result of love, of loving God, and of loving our neighbor. Probably best known is Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, commonly called the love chapter. You've probably heard it at lots of weddings. And the interesting thing is, is when Paul wrote it, he did not have the husband and wife relationship in mind. He had the church in mind. What does it mean to love in the body of Christ? He writes, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And then he concludes, So now faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these three is love. The gospel is Christ. What he has done and how his merits are ours by faith and faith alone. He has prepared good works beforehand and we shall walk in them. Ephesians chapter 1 says. The gospel is Christ. And the motivation for the gospel, the motivation for God to clothe himself with flesh and come and endure the torment of the cross is because of his love for the world. A work that he has done, is doing, and will do through his church. Through me and you. Love is not a feeling, brothers and sisters. We don't wake up one morning and say, I think I'll love folks today. <laughs> love, quite seriously, is an act of our will. Or perhaps even more biblical, it is an act of God's will, which throws, flows through us. And that love will, like Christ, be known through sacrifice. Now, that's a really tall order. And that's why Paul knew that if the church was going to be the place that sacrificially loved its neighbors, the community, the people for whom the world says is outside of the scope of compassion and mercy, those are the ones to whom we have been called to love. Paul knew that was hard the complexity of what families have to deal with in today, the struggle of people financially in their marriages, young people struggling with, with depression and uncertainty and economic fragility. It's a tough world out there. And God's remedy, God's answer, God's balm, God's healing medicine is you and me. Well, really, it's Him through you and me. So here we are. We've defined the gospel. We've looked at its consequence. And now we have been called to its posture. As our beloved Paul, 
kneels. We too kneel next to him, empty, hands open, humility to receive. That's the gospel posture. Merciful God, what we are being called to do is beyond our human strength and ability. And so kneeling, with heads bound and hands open, give to us what we need so that the world might know of your love. May we approach you and our neighbor in that gospel posture with humility, with love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, share the video. For more information about our church, please go to southsuburban.com.